the joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen, it's stirring up in me the strength of God. I believe that he has some restoration for you and I as we watch and listen to this episode because God is in the restoration business. I'm joined with Amanda today. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to listen to. All right, well, we have Dr. Gary Lovejoy and today we're going to be talking about marriages in the Bible and what we can learn from them. Well, we'll be joined in just a moment, you know, by this awesome marriage therapist and author, Dr. Gary Lovejoy, and he has some key advice to attaining a long-term happy and successful marriage. Matt, did All you right. ever realize that the issues in marriage are timeless? Oh my gosh, you know, it's so funny. I know we were talking about this earlier, but going into marriage, I think sometimes we don't think about kind of what we're getting into in a sense, like, you know, obviously there's the highs, you know, but then there are those times of the lows. So I'm really looking forward to today. I myself am probably gonna learn a lot <laughs> for my marriage, but, but also we have coming up later in the program that we're gonna reveal the answer to yesterday's stump the viewer question. And we'll announce the winner of this awesome prize pack that we got going on here of this book, this t-shirt, Listen, I'm looking at this book, Scriptures for Faith, Deliverance, and Healing. I don't know if we're going to send this to you guys. I might keep this one to myself. <laughs> <laughs> These are some great prizes. So thank you to all of you who participated. Yeah. I'm excited to find out. You know, I'm not usually here on a Friday. So yeah. y'all got a fun setup. We got prizes, but woo. <laughs> wow. Here we go, Matt. Are all you right, ready? I'm ready? You might need to call someone. I just have a feeling. <laughs> you know a couple who might need to know some information about marriages in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to invite them to join us because we are gonna dive in right now. You know, what is the key to a successful marriage? One of the ways we can find the answer to that question is by examining different relationships found right in the Bible, mm -hmm. who knew? By looking at both the good and the not so good ones, Dr. Gary Lovejoy is our guest and he's written a, a book called Marriages in the Bible. What do they tell us? Dr. Lovejoy, it's a pleasure to have you with us on Hope Today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Amanda and Matt. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Amen. Well, if you can just dig right in. We are on the edges of our seat. I have my pen for notes. We want to know, you know, say there is an issue. We'll start here with uh, a marriage. You know, whose responsibility is it to go initiate to get help? Well, usually uh, when a couple comes in, and oftentimes when uh, there is a marriage issue, uh, only one will come in, and then the other one will join them. But um, but usually it's the woman who comes in, the wife, and um, and if they come together, it's the wife that usually begins speaking. And um, and one of the things that's an uh, issue is for the uh, wife usually is that that she feels intensely lonely in her marriage. Uh, it's interesting because oftentimes they marry because they don't want to be alone. They want companionship. Mm. But when they get married, um, oftentimes they are experiencing a great deal of neglect. Uh, hubby may be coming home and involving himself uh, in his computer or his, uh, he may be watching football. He may be going out with his friends uh, to play uh, golf or something. And, uh, and she's feeling neglected. And she, uh, he's been intensely involved with people all day. Maybe she hasn't, especially if she's at home uh, with the children. She's talking to children all day. Doesn't have any adult language going on. So, um, so she's hungry for connection, and um, and he does not give it to her. And so she becomes increasingly unhappy. What happens then? And this goes right to uh, her issues of. Um, of sense of, of importance. She wants to feel important in her husband's life. Um, and so she gets angry over time. Resentments builds up and she's angry. And when she gets angry, she starts then nagging and, and criticizing him and, and, and so forth, expressing her anger in very dysfunctional ways. Um, oftentimes women are, are socially, um, um, so they're, so they're socialized, I think, to more spontaneously respond to what they see as a problem. And, are, and their communication skills are usually uh, superior to their husbands, so they're able to talk about their problem. 
and uh, and a man usually uh, the husband is uh, struggling because um, he doesn't want to talk about it, and um, and so she feels even more alone. But then when she starts into her criticism and so forth, it attacks an issue for him, which is his uh, sense of adequacy. She starts talking about how she and he will express that when he comes in. He says, no, whatever I do, it's wrong. Whatever direction I take, whatever thing I try to do, I try to satisfy her in some ways. And, and it, it never is good enough. I'm never good enough for her. And he's really expressing the fact that I never measure up in my marriage. And she reminds me on a daily basis. And it goes right to the heart of that sense of adequacy, which is extremely important for a man. So, so that, those are the issues that are usually initially when they come in. It's complicated because in marriage, it involves two sets of, of interpersonal skills and communication skills, uh, two sets of expectations, uh, two sets of family histories. It's a collision of two family histories, actually. And that's one of the first things we have to take a look at. Amen. That is such good wisdom for us. Will you talk about the marriage issues being timeless, meaning that we can learn from the marriages in the Bible. Would you mind jumping into maybe a couple different marriages in the Bible and just expounding on what we can learn? Sure. Uh, I'll take one of the ones that most people are familiar with. Um, I, I, there, I cover some 16 marriages, and some of them are people that... Uh, May, the reader may not be necessarily familiar with, but they are very, they're still prominent in Scripture. Um, but the one that I'm thinking about is Abraham and Sarah. Uh, we always think of Abraham as one of the heroes of faith, and he, he was. And in fact, he was a complex figure because it, when it came to his faith and following God's uh, uh, direction and his commands, he was incredibly bold. He took off with his family into a uh, land unknown to him. He was not familiar with the land of Canaan. And yet, uh, and so he didn't know that he could even survive in that land. And he was away from his family, which when you leave a family in the ancient world, that is extremely important. That's very rare. They always stay within their, the conclave of their own uh, family, their kin. But, uh, but he didn't, and he was very bold in that way. But when it came to domestic issues, he was a fairly an entirely different person. And as you know, he not just once, but twice uh, tried to pawn off his wife as his sister in, or, uh, to, in order to save his own life. He was afraid that, uh, that they might kill him so they could have her. She apparently was an attractive woman. And, uh, and, he, and it doesn't mention in there how Sarah feels about this at, at first, but it does later. Because uh, you have to ask, well, how is she feeling secure in her marriage? I mean, he's... Twice he pawned her off as, as uh, someone else so that he doesn't uh, save his skin. And in fact, I've often said to couples, I said, you know, if you're walking down the street and, uh, and, uh, and some dicey character's coming towards you in the other direction, how would you feel if your wife, if your husband pushed you in front of you, uh, in front of him and, and said, here, take her, spare me. Right. And that's essentially what uh, Abraham was doing. And it, they wouldn't be too happy with that. But, um, but then it shows up later on when the problem with Hagar, and, uh, and because she was barren, and Hagar, and so gave Hagar his hand, her handmaiden to Abraham, and she became pregnant with Ishmael. And she was so constantly harassing uh, and, and mocking uh, her mistress. And, um, and Sarah was just uh, dying inside because she wanted to have children so badly, and of course felt under a curse that she didn't, and he was, uh, uh, and, and all that is going right on, on under the nose of, of uh, Abraham, and he didn't do anything. He did nothing, and you knew he knew it. And finally, one of the most, one of the angriest exchanges in all the Bible take place. She confronts him, and she essentially says to him, do something, Get, do something. Can't you see I'm in trouble? I'm, I'm, I'm suffering here. And so do something. And what was his answer? Classic answer, essentially kind of like Pilate washing his hands. He said, well, do with her whatever you wish. Well, she was angry. Of course, she didn't handle that well, and she began mistreating Hagar. And what happens? Hagar runs for her life and takes her child with her. And so then Abraham has to then get up and go and rescue her, bring her back. 
All that could have been avoided if he had just dealt with the problem, but he didn't. And so she was, her anger, her explosive anger to him was illustrative, I think, of building up over and over where she felt neglected, that she was second class. And he, uh, uh, and she finally, that boiled over the surface. And so it was a sad, sad uh, uh, aspect of, to their domestic relationship, even though they were still known for the, the, the faith and so forth. So uh, that's, that is an example of one couple, which very high profile couple, we often talk about the great things that happened in that relationship, but we often don't see behind the domestic struggles and pain and the suffering that went on. You know, Dr. Lovejoy, one of the things that I really love that you just said is you have to address like the matter, right? And I'm thinking of this question that you said aggressiveness and passivity are, are both a cover for fear. So how does one begin to kind of recognize that and, and how would they address a situation like that within their marriage? That's a very good question. And, I, and transparency is really important. One of the reasons why, by the way, why it's so important is because um, you can't deal with problems that are underground. You can only deal with them when they're out in front. Hmm. And when you keep your spouse in the dark about what you're feeling and thinking, uh, then that goes underground and acts as a cancer that just eats away at the relationship. So transparency is very important. And it's illustrated in a number of these cases um, uh, uh, that uh, are covered in, uh, in Scripture. But, um, but when they deal with that, uh, they usually wait until the problem has become critical, had met critical mass, shall we say. And, um, and they're both uh, very angry at each other. So the chances of them uh, really dealing with it effectively are fairly low. As a matter of fact, uh, oftentimes when they come in, they're problem-centered. And the therapist's job is to try to move them to become solution-focused. And most uh, times the reason that, they are, that they're not solving their problems is because they are so fixated by the problem that they keep repeating the complaints that they have with each other, which only increase the, the feeling of alienation between each other. And so they don't know how to get out. And so many of them get stuck in ruts. I mean, really negative ruts, and they can't get out of them. Uh, I don't know if, if I had the time, I might share an example of what, what I did with a couple exactly in this situation. The wife came in, and initially she came by, in by herself, which was not uncommon. And, um, and she began talking about the fact that they had arguments every single day for five years. I don't know how they handled, and they're still even together. But... Uh, but anyway, they were talking, she was talking about it. I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, when he comes home, he hates his job and he takes it out on me and he comes home and he just loads uh, into me and he just really lets me have it. And I say, uh, well, what do you do? And she smiles. She says, well, you know, I'm no, uh, you know, I, I'm no uh, limp rag here. I, I re react. I get angry. And so then we end up in knockdown, drag out battles. And he said, some of them are just absolutely ugly until we're just exhausted. And this is how it goes on night after night after night. And so I looked at her and I said, one of the problems you have is too much predictability in your relationship. She looked at me like, that's my problem? <laughs> too much predictability. I, I reframed it for her because I wanted her to see something. And so, because you have to break up this, this almost mesmerizing uh, pattern that's destroying the relationship. Mm. So I told her, I gave her one um, instruction. I said, what I want you to do is on the way home, get a squirt gun and fill it with water and put it in your purse. And, uh, and when you do, uh, and have it with you at all times. And then when he starts in on you, because he, know, he can predict what you're going to do, right? Because she said, oh, yeah, she knows I, he knows I'm going to attack back. And uh, he says, well, this is the way I want you to change, change something. So instead of arguing with him when he comes home, <clears throat> just reach in your uh, purse, go, pull out your squirt gun and squirt in between the eyes and run out of the room giggling. Do you think you can do that? She says, yeah. He says, Would that surprise him? Do you think that'll be different than what you normally do? She says, oh yeah, very different. And so she did. And, and uh, so I, told, I gave her that instruction, she left. She came back two weeks later and she was radiant. And I said, and she said, 
I just want you to know my husband's waiting out in the waiting room if he wants to join us. And I said, oh, what, what has happened? She said, well, I did exactly what she said. She said, I got this work done. I filled it with water. And, uh, and he came home, and sure enough, he started in on me. And I, and I started, and then I suddenly realized, oh, yeah, that's right. I have an auto gun. So she said, I reached in, grabbed it, shot him, and ran uh, giggling out of the room. Except one thing she said I did do. I looked over my shoulder to see how he was responding. And he said he was standing there with a totally uh, flummoxed look on his face, like, what was that all about with water to be on? But it sure stopped the, the argument. And she said, oh, at least it stopped the argument. And so the next night, same thing happened. Third night, exactly the same thing began to happen. And so she reached in and grabbed her pistol and she whipped around, gave him a squirt, and she was looking down the barrel of his water gun. And uh, so she squirted him, he squirted her back. And what resulted in is an old fashioned water gun fight, which they ran through the house squirting each other and laughing to beat the band. So it's so much so that they fell, finally fell down on the living room floor, both soaked with water and laughing as hard as they can. And they suddenly looked at each other and they said, you know what? This is the first time in five years that we've laughed. Mm. And they were first attracted to each other because they could have, they, they were so good at having fun together, but they had lost the joy in their relationship. Mm. And they suddenly realized what they were losing and had lost. And so then they were serious about it doing something about that and they came in and we worked I worked with them for about six months and they had a marvelous relationship when we we're done but uh, but you had there was the, the key was not the the uh, squirt gun it was just anything that would break up that pattern that was so destructive in their marriage and that's one of the things that you want to do is begin to build a, a, a change that is that uh, takes out that that uh, commonality that uh, that is so destructive to the relationship and to make you introduce some level of surprise that breaks it up so that's an example of how we tackle some of those things this was absolutely enjoyable to hear i think i may go purchase a squirt gun <laughs> and have a little laughter and joy but thank you so much, Dr. Lovejoy. You truly brought joy to us all and much hope within our marriage relationship. And we appreciate you. Thank you so much. I sure appreciate you join, asking me to join you on your, in your show. Thank you. Well, stay with us because when we return in 60 seconds, we will announce the winner of yesterday's Stump the Viewer. Plus, we'll take a look at a scripture that talks about the significance of marriage and will also minister to your needs. We'll be right back. Discover what God's Word has to say about healing and deliverance. Best-selling author John Eckhart makes topical Bible study easy with his new book, Scriptures for Faith, Deliverance, and Healing. This handy reference is for those who want to have a greater understanding of healing and deliverance to incorporate God's Word into their prayers. Eckhart also includes targeted commentary to highlight key scriptures and life application. His spirit-filled perspective will enhance your time in God's Word and encourages the spiritual disciplines of memorization and meditation. Request scriptures for faith, deliverance, and healing as our thank you gift when you support Cornerstone Television this month. Request your copy today. If you want to strengthen the ministry of CTVN, share your best gift by visiting us online at ctvn.org donate or call us at 888-665-4483. Thank you for your partnership. Hope happens here. Welcome back to Hope Today. In case you missed it, yesterday was our first ever Stump the Viewer question that we asked you, the audience. So let's check out what the question was. It was, who was Saul's first missionary companion? And your possible choices were A, Peter, B, Ananias, C, Barnabas, or D, Silas. All right, Amanda, before we reveal this answer, what do you think it was? Hmm. 
I'm going to go with Barnabas. Barnabas. And it was Barnabas. <laughs> See, it looks like 75% of you got it right. Good job to everyone who did. So, okay, let's find out who the winner is. And it is Jan Hopkins. Jane, congratulations. You are the winner of this awesome Cornerstone t-shirt and this book, which is going to be hard to pry out of my hands because I kind of want this one. But congratulations to our winner, Jan. Listen, Amanda, I, I just we got to talk a little bit about uh, this whole conversation. But I want to start here with a scripture in Matthew 19, verses 3 through 6. It says, And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife or, or for any cause? He answered, have you not read that who, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God therefore has joined together, let man not separate. I love this scripture, man. And I think a lot of times, we know it's heard, you know, in a wedding ceremony, right? But it's, it's heard because it holds truth. Like, man shall not separate. But, you know, I, I kind of like this at the beginning when they're like, test the Pharisees are testing Jesus, you know? Isn't like marriage always a test? Like something always tests us in our marriage. It's so true. And I love, you know, your heart that you said, like going into marriage, do we have right expectations? Because mm. a lot of times you, you don't realize what you're bringing with you. And I think yeah. Dr. Lovejoy talked on that. These are two sets of like, um, behaviors, you know, that people are coming together, yeah, but wow. you're coming with your own household mm -hmm. junk, so to speak. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> right, that right. you have to purge through and become one. And mm. that is a process. So let me ask you and uh, you and Larissa's marriage, okay. you know, when you guys first got together, did you feel that? Did you have a little bit of that rumbling, shaking? Oh gosh. <laughs> let me tell you, confessing my faults to one another right now. I always love this because I feel like in the first year of marriage, right there's definitely a lot of that tension and rubbling like you said because you're bringing almost two different was it cultures backgrounds experiences anything in into one household and so in our first year let's just say it was definitely pretty difficult because i think the two of us were both kind of stubborn we're both hard-headed we're both independent and within that though we had to like really find like how we're complimenting one another. You know, you go into that that beginning portion of your marriage of like, well, this is what I'm bringing to the table, which I think can be good, but yet at the same time, you're like, but this is what I'm bringing to the table. You're not realizing that your your spouse is bringing something to the table as well that complements you. I mean, what about you? What, what did your first marriage look like with you and Gary? Well, I learned that he didn't, you know, roll the toothpaste up quite right. Oh, the boy. toilet paper was always put backward. You know, if there is a backward, he's like, how do yeah. you know which way is the right way? But it was like all those little things and you can so easily forget the joy, the things mm. that brought so much joy wow. to you as a yeah. couple. And I think that, you know, in Dr. Gary's um, just his example with the squirt gun, yeah. that joy that you had that you fell in love with, yeah. we need to mm. do a better job of reminding each other of that instead of critiquing all yeah. the little things yeah. that we don't like. And you know, I, I loved how he said about the, the ladies often deal with loneliness, mm. but the guys deal with like a, an inadequacy, like they yeah. don't feel like they're ever enough. So yeah. how important for, you know, to reverse that, that the, the guys out there make sure their lady know mm. you're not alone. Yeah. I'm right. with you. You know, that's so important. And then yeah. for the ladies, to say, you are enough for wow. me. You are God's assignment for me. Mm. And we were not always there. Yeah. I can tell you. And when children entered the scene, uh -huh. oh boy, woo, I was like, this man is weird. A whole, and <laughs> a whole new ball happened. game. Yeah. And I needed, like, um, I remember Cornerstone, we used to have Marriage on the Rock series with okay. um, Jimmy and Karen Evans. Y'all, God used that to really help me. And uh -huh. I think the same with Gary Lovejoy's yeah. uh, material. I mean, he's a psychologist. He's mm -hmm. been in this for 40 years. He has so much content out there. 
get the content because mm. that knowledge will help you grow yeah. in your relationship yeah. and it's so important. Yeah, you know, one thing I love that Dr. Lovejoy said, and, and actually I'm taking note of it, is, is breaking that cycle of predictability. I think that yes. that is because you, you probably don't even recognize that you do it throughout the years, right? Like Larissa and I are going, we're going on 13 years of marriage. Awesome. And I'm just like, but I, I almost need to go back and, and reassess, okay, what does our marriage kind of look like? Are, are we just falling into almost like a routine, right? right? Because you can't help it. Like you said, kids enter, right? You have careers, mortgages, homes, business, whatever that might look like. I mean, how have, has there been anything that you and Gary have done throughout the years of your marriage right. to kind of help to, to not stay in just this pattern? Yes, I think the biggest thing has been doing fireproof your marriage, mm. you know, like courses where you actually are investing, yeah. exo marriage conferences, yeah. like getting That's connected. Right. There is so much content out there, mm -hmm. you know, and you do need to make sure it's God content. That's right. But to grow yourself, you think about anything else we do in life, we educate ourselves. We, mm. but for some reason, we don't feel the need to educate ourselves when it comes to marriage, and yet yeah. it's the most important, other than wow. your relationship with God. Yeah. Marriage is the most yes. other important important here on earth That's relationship yeah. so take the time to invest because God desires to yeah. have that joy in your relationship and to be honest if he isn't the center mm -hmm. y'all we are a hot mess Ooh. and we need Jesus That's right. to be the center yeah well any words you said you have a lot of people in your life right now that are engaged and yes. ready to take the plunge into yeah. marriage what would your advice to them be I think your key word was just perfect it's just mm -hmm. investing like mm -hmm. so it has to start with us personally you have to invest yourself in the word of God invest in your heart your mind your spirit your soul a revelation of the love of God if you don't understand the love of God for yourself then it's going to be quite hard to love that other individual, right? Who's only flesh and bone, who's going to test your patience, you know, right. to test everything about you. But it starts personal. I think in investing in yourself first with the word of God and out of it will become a fruitful marriage. Amen. And we encourage you today to have that transparency with the one that God put in your life, because that way there's nothing in the dark and open your heart to that. Like this is the person that God chose for you. And if you're not married yet, God has someone, if that's in your heart or whether you're single, he desires to use you for his kingdom and glory. But transparency is such a invaluable part of a healthy relationship. Well, we pray that this program brought you much hope today. Be spontaneous, go get your water gun.